Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk uh, today. Uh, this is uh, the last talk of the session, so hopefully you're going to have fun. Uh, we've already seen in this conference so far that robots are rapidly becoming an integral part of our daily lives. Uh, in fact, we've seen a number of examples of those, uh, especially in uh, terms of home assistance, healthcare, and a number of other fields. And in the next few years, this is only continuing to grow, and uh, we're going to see tremendous societal and economic impact. However, most of the robots we see today are still uh, what I would consider fragile during real-world operation. And as an example, here you see a robot getting over a mesh, it gets stuck. And here's a video from the robot uh, DRC challenge from a couple of years ago, and this falls down and couldn't recover. And believe me, these are some of the best robots what we have today. This is the same robot which could do a black flip, uh, and uh, however, in uh, uncertain conditions, uh, they often tend to fail. In contrast, this is where animals thrive. Uh, in fact, animal performance is extremely robust, uh, what I mean by that is uh, they thrive in uncertain environments. And an example of that is you see this hummingbird uh, flying uh, just regularly. Uh, in a second, you're going to see rain falling on it, and it's going to get more rapid, and it doesn't uh, really mind. Uh, here you see an example of a mountain goat running on the side of a near-vertical cliff. Animals also perform in unexpected perturbations. Uh, for example, what I mean by that is you can see this hawk flying through extreme clutter, trying to grab the squirrel, and then uh, he's going back, uh, misses the first time, and tries again. Uh, here's one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is uh, basically a rattlesnake trying to grab a jerboa. This is an extremely slowed down video. And in the last instance, the jerboa makes a miraculous escape. Animals also perform using unreliable components. Uh, this is an example of a dog. This is a two-legged dog, Faith. Uh, he was on Oprah a few years ago, uh, and he's running around just uh, like he doesn't care. And lastly, here's an example of a crab who decides that one of his arms is luxury because it got injured in a fight. He just decides to pull it off and just run around. You get, you're going to see another angle of this in a second. Here you go. He's just pulling it off. All right. Uh, so if we want to build robots that can successfully leave lab environments and operate in the real world, uh, we need to start incorporating aspects of uh, biological systems into these robots. And that's where my research, the majority of my research focuses on. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the last few years, you see that uh, there's been an explosion in this field. Uh, in fact, there are a number of bio-inspired robots. This is just a small sample set of them. And we saw examples of this uh, right here at uh, some of the Boston Dynamics series of robots, which are beginning to incorporate some of those characteristics what I'm talking about uh, into the robots already. And you can already see the performance of those things. Uh, uh, in fact, research uh, in biomimetics and bio-inspired engineering uh, is growing rapidly, and in fact, it has a doubling rate of nearly two to three years, and which is extremely rapid compared to an average science, uh, which is more like 12 years. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's becoming a leading paradigm uh, for the development of new technologies that will potentially uh, significantly impact uh, our society and uh, our economy. And so today I'm going to talk to you about how I am thinking about this process and how do you learn from biological organisms, give you a couple of examples, and finally uh, tell you what I think are potential challenges uh, we're still trying to encounter as a community. And so the biodiscovery process, and uh, what I mean by that is how do we go about uh, understanding the principles, extracting them, and building robots. So typically, you start with an animal model. So uh, you do a bunch of experiments. Uh, you try to generate hypotheses as to what is going on. And using this hypothesis, you build a mathematical model or a physics-based model to basically explain your observations. And uh, if these turn out to be right, then uh, these models often help you come up with design rules, which you can then build into uh, robotic systems. And uh, so, what you can realize here is that there's a natural synergy between biology and different uh, fields of uh, engineering, mathematics, computer science, and so on. And what I mean by that is we're not trying to copy biology. We're not trying to basically mimic a biological system. But in fact, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use principles and analogies from biology, 
whenever they're useful, and integrated that with the best practices in all these other fields. And in turn, uh, what uh, these other engineering and other related fields do is they provide novel ideas and approaches uh, and even devices in many cases to generate further hypotheses and allow novel experiments uh, and measurements in biology that were never possible before. And a classic example of this is this observation from several years ago that animals, irrespective of their body size, the number of legs they have, they often run like a pogo stick which means that if you look at them, uh, it just basically looks like it's a spring sitting on, it's a mass sitting on top of a spring. And there's a very simple mathematical model. Uh, you have a mass, and uh, the only other parameter which you can play with is a spring, and if you look at what happens with biological systems, here's plotted leg stiffness as a function of body mass, and what you see is that it increases the function of body mass. However, something interesting pops out. So if you normalize stiffness uh, with respect to length and body mass, uh, what we see is that across the spectrum of animals, uh, most uh, animals basically have this like, magic number of around 10 where the relative uh, leg stiffness sits. And mathematical models have shown that this is really useful uh, in terms of uh, locomotion economy uh, and maintaining stability. In fact, if you use these numbers and build a robot, uh, that's what uh, collaborators at UPenn did. Uh, and uh, this is Rex, one of the first robots uh, to basically utilize this principle. And you see that uh, it's, it can run really effectively uh, under natural conditions. So further development of this robot took place in Boston Dynamics. Uh, and they expanded the capabilities further to go on a wide variety of terrains. Uh, and all of this achieved without any changes to the leg motion or using any sensors. So uh, that's really impressive for this robot. And if done right, you can even scale this up uh, to a human scale. So this is a two-seater version of the same robot. Uh, and here you see one of the first trials of it uh, picking up and trying to walk. All right, great. So. Uh, next, I'm going to talk to you about some of my research uh, and how this plays into the whole system and uh, what I have learned from the cockroach. Uh, who is a fan of the cockroach? Well, there's at least one person that does. Uh, <laughs> so cockroaches are one of my favorite animals to uh, study and understand and get inspired from. And the reason is this. They're found everywhere. And if you're trying to build a robot which can go out in the natural world and do all the kind of things what you want, who's better to learn from than a cockroach? Uh, so uh, back in uh, the 90s, uh, Bob Full's lab at Berkeley discovered that cockroaches were among the fastest animals uh, with respect to body size. In fact, they held the Guinness record until a few years ago. And so they can run over a meter and a half a second, which for a human is about running at 200 miles an hour. Uh, and at these higher speeds, they can even go bipedal and quadrupedal. There, we also know that they're excellent climbers. Uh, around the time I started my graduate school, uh, we were not sure how they make the transition from running on level grounds to climbing the vertical wall. So I decided to do this experiment where I was basically chasing them down this track and forcing them to climb up a vertical wall. And this is what happens in real time. It looks like a rapid, smooth vertical transition. And uh, here's it again. Uh, and the reason why it looks so smooth is because this entire transition happens in mere 75 milliseconds. Uh, but if you listen carefully, this is what I was hearing as, uh, well, there you go. Uh, anyways, uh, so when we slowed this uh, video down uh, 50 times, what we observed was that cockroaches were basically running rapidly without changing anything, and they were basically crashing into the wall head first. Uh, this is a close-up version of the same, and uh, they were doing this behavior over 80% uh, of the times. And basically what that means, uh, the reason why you think they might be doing this is because if they used any other strategy, they were about 20% slower. And what that means is if a predator is chasing you, that's the difference between life and death if you're a cockroach. Uh, and this principle of relying on the body mechanics is actually fairly common in biological systems. Uh, in fact, uh, you see the geckos trying to land on uh, trees. They just basically crash land. 
Uh, similar behavior is seen when locusts are jumping, and they don't really have any special mechanisms to land. They just land on their body. Uh, and the bees are often shown to like bump into each other as they're entering hives, and so on. Uh, in fact, the most extreme case of this is the barnacle gosling. So the story is that uh, barnacle goslings hatch at the top of hills, and they need to get down almost about 400 feet uh, before uh, they, can act, they can have access to food. Uh, and so basically, every single member of the species uh, needs to basically jump off the cliff because they realize that's probably the best strategy and the fastest way to get to food. And so here you see it's falling, falling, and it just crashes into the rocks. It falls again, and it's bouncing around a few more times, and here are doted parents waiting at, uh, down there. And what you see is miraculously, the bird is safe. And uh, this is what every single member of the species has to go through to survive. And uh, in fact, uh, you can imagine that this kind of strategy of relying on your body is not effective at all scales. So uh, definitely, if you're the size of human, uh, then potentially, if you run into a wall, then you can have disastrous consequences. Uh, in fact, a biologist back in the 1920s tested this, uh, and basically what he observed was that you could drop a mouse down a thousand year mine shaft and arrive at the bottom, it only gets a slight shock and walks away. A rat is killed, a man is broken, and a heart splashes. <laughs> now, he was a biologist. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, so uh, if you basically try to like, measure how much kinetic energy these animals have uh, as they're falling and plot it as a function of size, here are the Handale, Haldane animals. Here's the entire spectrum. And what you observe is that as you increase size, you have more and more energy per unit body mass. And what we did is we built a model uh, making some assumptions and treated the body as a bunch of springs and dampers. And we estimated how much energy you could potentially absorb just based on your mechanics. And it turns out that this is a decreasing function. So as you increase in size, the amount of energy you can dissipate decreases as a function of body size. Uh, and so what this means is basically there is a straight off beyond which if you're beyond a particular size, you cannot rely on the strategy. So you need to be under a particular size to be able to exploit that. And this is what our collaborators at the Fearing Lab in UC Berkeley did, uh, and they built Dash, a uh, dynamic uh, autonomous sprawled hexapod. That's a robot uh, on the stage. Uh, and so this is built using the smart composite microstructures. Uh, and so basically, you start off with an origami design. You fold it out. You use a laser to cut out different flexures. Uh, and then you bond it with heat and pressure. You cut out individual structures, and you fold it out just like an origami, and then you get the entire robot. So the advantage of this process is that you can make structures with really high degrees of freedom uh, in under one, one hour. And so here's Dash. So you see that the body is really compliant. And you can drop it from different heights, uh, and because it has, I, it's light, it can dissipate all that energy. And we even dropped it off the top of a building, uh, the tallest building on campus, and then it survived. So we're going to try a demo of this. Uh, so let me see how all this works. OK. Let's fall down. And here you go. He's fine, just running around. All right. Uh, so, uh, moving on. Get the slides back, please. Uh, so we use this idea to basically put a nose on the robot, uh, and without any sensor, uh, this robot can now basically do this transition uh, by just uh, uh, running at the wall as fast as it can and bouncing off the surface and rearing up. And the strategy of basically relying on your exoskeleton has been since then adapted in a number of systems. So here you see some examples of jumping robots. Uh, here are some flying robots. 
And if you want this robot, uh, you can even like go and buy it off Amazon right now. Some friends of mine start, start this company to basically uh, mass produce this robot. Uh, and uh, in fact, so that was uh, so moving on. I'm going to tell you another story, which is why most of you probably hate a cockroach. I think uh, uh, it's really creepy. And the reason is uh, they can manage to get into even the smallest of spaces. So just to give you an idea, a cockroach standing up tall is about 15 millimeters tall, and that's what it looks like uh, in front of two stack pennies, which are about three millimeters. And we challenged the cockroach. We were curious as to how they can get into extremely small spaces. And uh, what we did was we were like, OK, uh, what's the smallest size you can do? Uh, and we saw that they were able to get into spaces almost three millimeters. So you see squeezing through a gap, which is a small thing. And uh, what is really impressive is that behavior takes under a second. And what's more interesting is that uh, once they get into these gaps, if they're confined between two plates, they can still move very rapidly. So here's it unconfined, real time, and then slowed down 20 times. Here's it between two plates, which are 12 millimeters, so you can see it bouncing up and down. And here it is uh, within two plates, which are four millimeters. And uh, it's moving at almost five buttons a second. And to give you an idea what that is, that's the speed at which Usain Bolt runs at for his like, world record 100 meter dash. And it's doing that when it's squished to four millimeters. Uh, so we did some experiments trying to understand the exoskeletal design. We did CT scans. We even dissected them. And basically what we found that despite having hard components, uh, they were basically were comp composed of uh, exoskeletal plates, which are interconnected by compliant membranes. So overall, they could be really squishy. Uh, and we were curious as to what the forces they were producing. So no animals were harmed in the study. We actually tested that before and after this. Uh, we they ran and flew just fine. So we basically put them in a materials testing machine, squished them a bunch of times, and measured what kind of forces they produced. And what we observed was that they behaved like viscoelastic materials. By that, I mean that the forces they experienced were both a function of the compression and also the rate of compression. And at the smallest gap size, we saw that they could take forces as much as 800 times their body weight, and they were still able to move. And using all these ideas, uh, we built CRAM, uh, our compressible robot with articulated microstructures. So this robot is basically a modified version of Dash with a shell and a few different mechanisms. It can be squished in half. Uh, and uh, it borrows principles uh, from the construction of a cockroach exoskeleton, as you see here. Uh, and here's the different key components. Uh, so you have a shell. You have a layer which lets you sprawl and change your angles. Uh, and this is a tough but compliant uh, shell. So here's a deforming under 20 pound loads and can pop right back up. Uh, this is a sprawl layer, which basically enables the robot to uh, be standing upright, but also when squished, uh, rotate its body out of the way and still have some portion of your legs in contact with the ground so that you can uh, run ahead. And this is the robot running on compress in real time. And here's the same running 50% uh, compressed. All right, so this was great. Uh, so, uh, so both these examples uh, were systems, what I showed, uh, they were inspired from a cockroach, but they were not really the size of a cockroach. So they were more like palm-sized robots. And if you want to build smaller systems, how do you do that? And that's been uh, the bulk of my work for the last uh, few years. Uh, and uh, presenting here is the Harvard Ambulator Micro Robot. So this is one of these robots I'm holding in my hand. Uh, so it, uh, this project actually started uh, when my uh, mentor at Harvard, uh, Rob Wood, was uh, back in Berkeley as a grad student. It's gone through several iterations, and currently it's in the sixth instantiation, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like. It's about the size of a cockroach, and it weighs as, as much as a cockroach, and uh, it, it has four legs, uh, and each leg is powered by two piezoelectric actuators. Uh, so basically what that means uh, is these are muscle-like uh, 
uh, self-sensing high bandwidth actuators which can uh, operate at a wide range of frequencies, uh, and they can actuate as fast as 100 hertz, which is uh, unheard of in biological systems. Uh, and uh, basically, each leg has two actuators. This is the lift degree of freedom, which is basically lifting up and down. And uh, you have a swing degree of freedom, so going back and forth. And by changing the timing between these two degrees of freedom, we're able to get a variety of gates. And in terms of performance, how does it rate against a cockroach? It, it runs about as fast as a cockroach. Here it is again. Uh, this is the same video slowed down 20 times. Uh, what you see is that uh, it's running about as fast as a cockroach, but it's, trying to, it's cycling legs three times as fast. Uh, it's also capable of some really highly dynamic behaviors. Uh, it can jump in place uh, by almost a body height. Uh, and uh, if you want it, uh, it can also pop a wheelie. Uh, the robot, uh, because it's extremely light, it's capable of coasting on the surface of water, uh, and uh, it exploits surface tension. Uh, and by using the principle of electro-wetting, we can get it to sink and uh, actually crawl underwater. You'll see it sink in a second. And it's going to crawl on the surface and make its way back. By swapping out the feet, we can use electro-adhesion and make it climb vertically. So here's an example of the robot uh, working, climbing straight up on a metallic surface. Uh, you can also climb inverted. And in collaboration with the partners uh, at Rolls-Royce, uh, we are uh, envisioning uh, building a swarm of these, uh, which can one day uh, be uh, like inserted into an endoscope-like system, get into the interior of a jet engine block, uh, and uh, scan for any damages due to like bird collisions or something, fix any things, uh, and so on and so forth. And some of our earliest uh, iterations is, uh, this is a uh, hammer trying to walk inside a jet engine block. And uh, what makes this even interesting is that uh, this is not the smallest version of hammer we can make. Uh, we can go even smaller. Uh, and uh, this is an example of a half-scale version. So this is just about the size of a penny. Uh, and uh, this is one of the earliest prototypes, and you can see it uh, running along. And the technology of the manufacturing process which enables all of this, uh, we call it the PC-MEMS fabrication technology, which is essentially the, an evolution of the smart composite microstructures, which I talked about a few slides ago, which went into the making of Dash and Cram. Uh, so again, uh, we use a laser micromachining system to basically pattern uh, different layers. Then we stack all these layers and align them continuously, uh, and then we release them, uh, and uh, we assemble the entire robot by folding. And uh, using this process, we are able to make uh, really complex structures. So Hammer as a robot has over 60 joints with features as small as 40 microns. Uh, and the main advantage of this compared to the previous technique was that you don't have to assemble by hand anymore. Uh, so we build in uh, all the uh, assembly features uh, into folding mechanisms and we can just, uh, the entire robot is built as a monolith structure, we can just pop it out. This is inspired from the children's pop-up books uh, uh, kind of uh, process. And the power of this technique really comes to the floor, uh, com comes to the fore when we're thinking about even smaller systems. So this is the Harvard RoboBee, which is the size of a bee. Uh, it's a platform which weighs mere 80 milligrams. Uh, I have one of those in my hand. Uh, and it, it can hover, it can fly forward, basically do uh, all the things what you can see in miniature flying systems today. Um, and uh, in the past, it required several hours of graduate student work. Uh, to basically hand assemble uh, and lots of uh, hand-eye coordination, almost like a surgeon. Uh, but now, uh, we can make it using uh, the Papa MEMS technology where everything, uh, including the actuators, the wings and sensors, so on and so forth required for the uh, robot are fabricated as different layers. And they're all stacked up and then we can pop them up and release the device just as needed. So here you see the pop-up mechanism in action. And so this really enables us to start thinking about uh, mass producing them and building these things systems at scale. All right. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, the Harvard RoboBee right now. 
And if you listen really quietly, uh, you can even hear it uh, buzzing like a real bee. Can you switch the slides, please? Yeah, there you go. Uh, so you can see the wing mechanism uh, flapping uh, at really high speed. So this is going at over 100 hertz. All right. Thank you. Can we switch to Hammond now? So what you're seeing on stage uh, is uh, Hammer uh, with all its power and control electronics on board and weighs a mere uh, 2.5 grams, and it's going to execute uh, some pre-programmed maneuvers. So it's going to run straight, uh, do a couple of turns, use different gates, uh, try to walk back. All right. Thank you. Can you go back to the slides, please? So all right, uh, so I've shown you several examples of uh, where we are and what uh, we've been able to achieve in trying to learn from biological systems. Uh, however, there are still uh, a number of challenges uh, which uh, we potentially want to solve before we can get to capabilities similar to that of animals. And one of the challenges, uh, I think, is uh, if you look at biological systems, they have uh, material, they're built of materials which are really complex. Uh, they have hierarchical uh, structures. They're often multifunctional. They, uh, and so I think that's one of the things uh, what we want to begin to think about for biological systems so, or robotic systems. So if we have materials uh, that can couple sensing, actuation, computation, and probably communication, uh, we can get one step closer to how biological systems behave. Uh, another challenge is, some, is biological systems are extremely fail-safe or fault-tolerant. Uh, and uh, in fact, as I was a student trying to do experiments in biology, uh, we often wanted perfect organisms because we wanted to control experiments. And it was really hard uh, because, uh, as the survey shows, uh, if you uh, scan a natural population, most often they're missing something. Then you'd often never find uh, uh, insect-like systems or arthropods in general uh, having intact structures. Uh, and this has even led to a spare leg or a spare appendage kind of hypothesis. And as a good biologist, I decided to test this. So here's a cockroach leg. And what I've zoomed in into just a foot, uh, where you see a number of different structures. You have the spines, uh, you have friction plates, you have claws. This is a uh, really complex structure which they use to cling onto different surfaces and do all the behaviors they need to do. Uh, so what I did, I did performance tests, ran them intact. And then I slowly ablated different parts of the foot. And then I removed the entire leg as such. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to find out uh, what, uh, how far they're robust. And uh, so in terms of basically ablating the foot, I'm just going to show you some examples of the test cases, what we did. So we ran them on uh, level grounds, measured the forces they produced, and measured the speeds. Uh, we ran them on rough terrains. We even pulled the ground from underneath them. And we challenged them to climb up walls. Um, and so here's what happens uh, when they're running on a flat surface. Uh, on the top, you see animal running with feet. and the bottom, they're running without feet. And so this is real time, and now it's slowed down. And you basically see that there's no difference between the two of them. Uh, this again, you can challenge them to go on more complex surfaces. And uh, when you measure the speed, uh, they go just as fast. They don't. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no increase or no significant decrease in performance. Uh, they can even climb near vertical walls uh, with absolutely no feet. Uh, so if you have the right surface, so for example here you have a rough surface, so uh, and they're able to go almost all the way. Uh, however, if you have an extremely smooth surface uh, like glass, then they're not going to go anywhere. So they're just going to go up. So, so this is the only real case where we found that uh, the loss of feet really mattered. Uh, so what, what happened, the secret to why they were able to perform is because they relied on the spines at the base of foot. So these spines are actually sensory structures, uh, which uh, they often use to know how much the leg is being loaded. But in this case, they were using it as auxiliary feet uh, when they lost the natural feet. 
And so next, I proceeded to basically take out entire leg structures. So this is a cockroach uh, running naturally. This is in real time. Uh, and so what you observe is that uh, often they use a tripod gate. By that, what I mean is they use the front and hind leg on one side, uh, coupled with the middle leg on the op opposite side in sync. And uh, here it is again. And now what you see uh, is on the top is an intact animal, and uh, bottom, I've removed one middle leg. And all these videos are 20 times slowed down. And if you carefully look at the legs, uh, first, you observe that the cockroach is not slowing down at all. And second, what you observe is that uh, they're maintaining the coupling between the legs. They're not really changing the timing at all. So it seems like they're not trying to change anything about how they move. So let's see what happens when we take out two middle legs. So they're rocking back and forth a lot more, but in terms of forward speed, they're almost as fast. We can take out an entire tripod, and uh, lo and behold, uh, they still try to uh, keep cycling their legs as if they had another tripod, uh, and you can't really stop them. So uh, even with four legs removed, uh, they're going uh, slower, but they're only 50% slower, which is remarkably impressive. Wouldn't be nice to have robots with these features. So, uh, and another area which I think, uh, especially in uh, of interest to this conference, is uh, we've been making rapid progress in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence over the last few years. Uh, and I think this is also one area where biological systems uh, are remarkably impressive. So what I'm going to show you uh, is uh, a squirrel, uh, he's trying to basically jump across a very compliant platform uh, onto another uh, rigid surface uh, where he has a nut, and uh, you see what happens. So this is the first time the animal is trying to do this behavior, and as you see, he's, he almost fails. Uh, and uh, this is the second attempt, slightly better. So this is work done by my colleague Nate Hunt uh, back at Berkeley and now at University of Nebraska. Uh, the third time is even better. And by round four, you can see that there's a spring in the step and he almost uh, basically nails the landing uh, within five attempts. And so the time scales on which uh, biological systems learn and begin to adapt to their environment surroundings is really, really impressive. And so if you're going to start thinking about uh, building robots with capabilities uh, approaching that of animals, uh, we need to start to think about uh, uh, some of these ideas. And what I've shown today uh, are some examples from my work, such as uh, the use of modular appendages, uh, having multifunctional exoskeletons, having hierarchical feet. Uh, and uh, so these can begin to like, make smarter robots. Uh, and in fact, as uh, these robots begin to take on uh, uh, more characteristics of biological systems, nature can become a much more useful teacher. Uh, and uh, not only that, our curiosity-driven research is in fact uh, helping address uh, critical societal needs. So the uh, cram uh, can potentially uh, squish itself and get into really tight spaces like crevices and so on and so forth, uh, which is really hard to access uh, for uh, normal systems uh, or other larger robots. Uh, the ability to climb vertically and invert it and transition across these different modes uh, is, again, something really useful if you want to do tasks like inspection. Uh, and finally, using uh, cheap, scalable manufacturing techniques enables you to build a number of these robots, and uh, this can potentially, uh, we can think about deploying them for uh, applications like environmental monitoring, and finally, one day, we can probably shrink them down uh, to sizes where they can uh, be assistive devices for healthcare, crawling inside your body, and so on and so forth. So finally, I want to thank uh, my advisor, Bob Full, Rob Wood, uh, all my collaborators, my funding agencies. Uh, and if you want to learn about more about this kind of research, uh, this is what my new home is going to be. Come visit me at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, starting in January. And last but not least, uh, thank you very much to Amazon and all of you uh, for being here and listening to my talk. Thanks. <laughs>